Then I posed as an old war veteran to be able to get to the wife of my birth father. Uh, I looked up his obituary. It turns out that Bob Harris was a Pearl Harbor survivor. He died in March, um, three months before we actually had this meeting. So I called the funeral home that was listed in the obituary and told them that I just got back into the country. And I heard that my old Navy buddy died. And could I have the address of his wife so I could send a mass card? And that's the kind of way I was able to meet Bob's wife um, and get info about my birth father because uh, Faye, the wife, knew about the affair that uh, he was having and knew about me. Um, turns out my birth father and I have a lot of similarities. Music always came easy to me. No one else in my adopted family uh, was musical, but my father played guitar and sang. You're listening to the Just Sayin' Podcast, offering conversations with experts that will educate, inform, and entertain. Here's your host of the Just Sayin' Podcast, Charlie Cornaccio. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Just Sayin' Podcast. I'm going solo today because I wanted to share with you a major event in my life as an update to another major event in my life. So if you've been following me on Facebook, then you may have seen a call to action recently where I was asking for anyone who knew someone with a story of adoption, whether it be that they were the adoptee or a birth mom who had to give the child away or reunion stories that somebody may have, uh, those kinds of experiences. So I received some pretty good responses and some feedback. And so I'm coordinating that podcast on adoption for another couple of weeks. But today I wanted to share my adoption story with those of you who may not have heard it before and let you know what has transpired in recent years with the advent of all of these um, DNA home kits and matches on websites like Ancestry.com and one, two, three. So I was legally adopted at one year, seven months. I was fostered at five months. Uh, the same family that fostered me kept me, even though I was sick as a dog when they brought me home from Catholic Charities. Uh, Catholic Charities in the Bronx was uh, the organization and told my adopted mother and father that they could bring me back because I was so sick and they could swap me out for another child. But my adopted parents, Emily and Maddie, said no. And that started the process of them staying up through the nights with me as I battled the croup and asthma and so many other things in my life. Um, I found out that I was adopted when I was eight years old. My mother, Emily, showed me my original birth certificate. And my name on the birth certificate, my name was actually Paul Henry Cosentino, but my adopted parents named me Charles after my father's father. When I was in my early 20s, I had two children. I know, right, in my early 20s, two children. Um, I was a young father. My daughter Jessica was born when I was 19, and I was 22 when my son Adam was born. My wife Marianne was just 17 at the time when Jessica was born, then 21 with Adam. And um, we're about to celebrate our 47th or 48th anniversary. Anyway, uh, like most adopted people will tell you when they start having children, you begin to worry about health-related things, those things that might skip a generation. And my health was never really that good. So as a young parent, I really had a lot to be concerned about and wanted to make sure that, you know, my kids weren't going to get something that maybe skipped a generation. So in my early 20s, I decided to look for my birth mother. Now, I knew that her last name was Cosentino because of uh, the birth certificate that my mother had shown me. Uh, but in that conversation, when I asked who my real parents were, my mother, Emily, told me that all she remembers is that they said my birth mother's name was Mary and um, that she was young. So I started looking in the phone books where I worked in New Rochelle. We had uh, a wall with mounds of phone books because 
this was the mid seventies with no internet. And you had to actually look up the name and the, the listing would have the person's name and the address and the phone number in most cases. In fact, for those of you who are younger, this will blow your mind. Uh, there was a number that you could call for the time, and it would tell you the time right now is, uh, also for the weather and for sports scores from the night before. Crazy, right? I know. Anyway, uh, so I started with the book from the phone book from the Bronx because um, of Catholic charities. There was a Manhattan, Staten Island, Westchester, Brooklyn, Queens, every county had a book of telephone numbers. And as I went through the C's, I came across an M. Cosentino. So I decided to call that number. And that, well, but the thing was, what was I going to say? Well, my mother, Emily, told me that Mary was a 16-year-old girl who had to give me up because she was underage or something like that. So I figured I would call the number and doing the math, I would listen to see if the voice sounded like someone in her 40s at that point. And so I started practicing saying, hello, is there a Mary Cosentino living there? And if I got Mary on the phone, my next question would be, does the name Paul Henry Cosentino mean anything to you? So I don't know. So Mary may have been married by then. And in that case, her name could have changed, but I had to start somewhere. So I started with the Cosentinos. And so I dialed the number on a rotary phone. And with each turn of the dial, I could feel like my stomach started burning with butterflies forming and my throat was closing up. And I realized I can't do this. So I hung up and that's my story. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's plenty more to the story. And it actually gets crazy. In fact, I wrote a book that uh, was released in 2014. And if you want a copy, um, you can comment on my podcast website and we'll contact you for your address and all that good stuff. Or you can go to Amazon and type in how I met my mother and the four brothers I never knew I had. And you can order it there. It's on Kindle or, um, you know, paperback. <clears throat> it is a good read. Just saying. I did have a five-star rating on Amazon. Anyway, all right. So I, I put the phone down. I was too nervous about it. I tried to calm myself down. I was working at a place called American White Cross Labs in the big Knickerbocker Press building in New Rochelle of New York. And um, you can see that building from I-95 as you're going north. It's on the right-hand side. Big, huge, old, old building from like the 1800s. So I took a walk through the factory practicing my lines. Hello, is there a Mary in this house? Does the name Paul Henry Cosentino mean anything to you? And then I felt I was calmed down. I came back to the office and I dialed the number again. And it started ringing. And a woman answered. And she said, hello. <laughs> she sounded much older than 40. But I forced out the words to come out as casual as they could. And I said, hello, is there a Mary living in this house? <laughs> as the words came out, I could tell I sounded creepy before creepy was even a word back then. So to make matters worse, the lady on the other end of the phone says, what? And I'm like, oh, my God, I got to go through this again. So I did. Uh, and this time I sounded more like me. Um, I was wondering if there's a Mary living here. And uh, the woman all of a sudden calls out away from the phone to somebody else in the house. And she calls out, Mary. And then without warning, here come the butterflies and the sinking feeling in, in the pit of my stomach, and I'm getting choked up. But could this be the moment? One phone call. Is it really that easy? So suddenly, another woman gets on the phone, and she sounded like she was in her 40s, but she also sounded very angry. 
So she says, hello, who is this? <laughs> I felt like I was bobbling the receiver in my, uh, my hand as I blurted out, uh, does the name Paul Henry Cosentino mean anything to you? <laughs> and so she rips right back at me and says, look, we're very sick in this house and we don't have time for this. And she hung up. I stood there just holding the receiver to my ear, knowing that there was no one on the other end of the phone, but was it her? Did I spook her? And I wondered what she was doing right now. Was she like, oh my God, he found me. Anyway, so my next plan of attack, genius, was to go to the address and stake out the house. I would look for a woman who looks like me. I was in my early 20s. That was my plan. But anyway, so the next day, um, I'm sitting in my office and I'm going through the sports page pages of uh, the Daily News in the morning. And I turn the page after the sports section and there's Ann Landers. Now, for those of you who may not remember, Ann Landers was an advice column where people would write in and ask for Ann Landers to solve whatever problems they were having with their husband or their wife or their kids. It was entertaining. So the first thing that catches my eye is that Ann Landers is answering a question from a woman who met her biological parents. How coincidental, I thought. So as I read through that column, it turns out that this was not a happy reunion. Uh, the woman's birth mother, when she found her, wanted nothing to do with her. And when she found her father, he was strung out on drugs. And so the woman was like just really disappointed and distraught. And um, Ann Landers' response was, we always think as adopted children that our birth parents are living in this beautiful home out in the country with a white picket fence and good jobs, when in reality, it is rarely, if ever, the case. So she went on further to say to be careful not to get your hopes up because you may not like what you find. And as I was reading that last part, I could hear that woman's angry voice saying, look, we're very sick in this house. We don't have time for this right now. And so that kind of spooked me. And I thought about it for a while and I decided pretty much right there and then that I was not going to look for my birth parents for fear that I might not like what I find. So that was about it for me. Uh, at least for another 16 years. 16 years go by of going to the doctors and being asked the question, do you have a history of cancer or Crohn's or asthma or anything else? And my response was always the same. I don't know. Um, I didn't think I would ever know. But then I had been a, uh, got a job as a TV sportscaster at a cable station in upstate New York, about 65 miles from New Rochelle. I met a guy who said that I could be a twin for his brother. He told me he watches the news all the time and he can't get over the resemblance. In fact, he said that his friends who know his brother Robert say the same thing, that we look like twins. So I asked the guy what his name was, just trying to be polite, and he said, Mike, Mike Cosentino. Yep, that's right. There he was standing right in front of me, Michael Cosentino, who turns out to be an older brother of mine. So I'll give you a little more of the story, but uh, if you want to get the whole story, uh, and, and I'm telling you, it's a crazy story with plenty of examples of how our paths cross uh, many, many times, uh, but we never knew it until we finally met each other. I encourage you to get the book or get it for somebody you know who was adopted, because this story ends well, and it's got a great message. So here's Mike Cosentino talking about how much I look like his brother. And he's saying how we've got to be related somehow. Um, it's uncanny the way you guys look so much alike. And so I thought, well, 
Mary's probably married now and has a different last name. So maybe she's the sister of Mike's father, which might make her an aunt or something. So I asked him, do you have an aunt named Mary? And he paused and he looked at me strangely. And then he said, no. He said, I have an aunt Amelia. And so I said, well, I know that my mother's name was Mary and her last name was Cosentino. And, and that was the end of our conversation. Uh, we said our pleasantries and that was that. Uh, the very next day, as I'm coming off the news desk uh, for our 5.30 broadcast, somebody comes to me and says, Charlie, you have a phone call. So I go to the phone and it's Mike's wife on the other end. And she says, hi, I'm Betty, Mike's wife. Uh, what was all this stuff you were telling Mike about an aunt named Mary? Is this a joke? Uh, did he have the guys from, I guess he was a practical joker. Did he have the guys from the lodge put you up to this? And it turns out, Mike being the practical joker he is, Betty thought that the guys in the lodge put me up to this ruse with Mike to get back at him. So I told Betty, no, I was adopted. And I know that my birth mother's name was Mary Cosentino. And there was a long pause. And then Betty says, my hair is starting to stick up. That's his mother's name. Da, 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 da. <laughs> so as it turns out, we are actually brothers. And there are three others brothers who I met. Louis, who uh, I met but has since passed. Michael, who got this whole thing rolling. Robert, who turns out to be actually just one year older than me, almost to the day. He was born on July 9th and I was born the next year on July 15th. And then there's the youngest brother, Vinny. So four brothers who I never knew I had. Um, fast forward a couple weeks later, Mike took me to meet my birth mother, Mary. And uh, it was a, a very good meeting. Turns out she wasn't 16 when she had me, but my birth father's name, because she had me out of wedlock, was Bob Harris, who had just passed three months before all this went down. So I keep in touch with the brothers. We've been to each other's houses and uh, family functions and weddings and funerals and things like that. Um, Michael, Robert, and myself even played together in a men's adult hardball league for about a year. Um, I remember a funny story in one of those games. I was the last out of the inning. And then when we came back up to bat, Robert was the first batter in the next inning. And the pitcher comes off the mound and stops the game. And he's pointing to Robert and he's yelling to the umpire and to our dugout, this guy batted already, this guy batted already. And it turns out with our helmets on, we actually did look very, very similar. So we got to laugh at that one. Uh, but there are some other crazy stories that, um, that are in the book. Um, one is that I posed as a doctor to get my birth medical records from Mr. Gordy Hospital in the Bronx. Um, without caller ID back then, it was actually a lot easier than you might think. And then I posed as an old war veteran to be able to get to the wife of my birth father. Uh, I looked up his obituary. It turns out that Bob Harris was a Pearl Harbor survivor. He died in March, um, three months before we actually had this meeting. So I called the funeral home that was listed in the obituary and told them that I just got back into the country. And I heard that my old Navy buddy died. And could I have the address of his wife so I could send a mass card? And that's the kind of way I was able to meet Bob's wife um, and get info about my birth father. Because uh, Faye, the wife, knew about the affair that uh, he was having and knew about me. Um, turns out my birth father and I have a lot of similarities. Music always came easy to me. No one else in my adopted family uh, was musical, but my father played guitar and sang. So now some 28 years later, my brother Robert asked me to do a sibling DNA test with him because he thinks maybe there's a possibility and the results come back 
99.7% that we are, in fact, full brothers. So now we're trying to get Michael to take the test because um, if he comes up with the same results, then we've got some figuring out to do. But it's clear that I do have a full brother, at least one full brother, and we're wondering if it's coincidence that Robert, my brother, was named after Bob Harris. So as this podcast falls between my birthday and my brother Robert's birthdays, I wanted to encourage all of those adopted people who are still searching um, that there can be a happy ending, but to be happy where you are right now. No, you know what I'm saying? In other words, don't be thinking, oh, I could have had a better life or I wonder what was. God puts us where he wants us. And in his time, you'll get the answers. And that's what happened for me. Um, anyway, that is it for this edition of the Just Saying Podcast. Thanks for listening. Get the book because um, it gives you the full story of all the crazy stuff that happened. And next week, if you're a parent of a child playing baseball, uh, you want to tune into our next show because our guest is a former professional baseball player, Kevin Gallagher, who has developed a method for parents to teach their young baseball players how to have success in the batter's box. As Kevin puts it, if a kid can hit, he won't quit. And with Major League Baseball interest at a 16-year low, uh, the timing for all of this sounds perfect. So, Listen for that one. Don't miss an episode of the Just Saying Podcast. You can do that by subscribing. Hit the subscribe button on this podcast or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. And uh, we will see you next time. Stay safe and be kind. Thanks for tuning in to the Just Saying Podcast. 